Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for our last Thread Talk hour. Uh, we're excited to feature three additional speakers today, but before we jump into this hour of programming, I want to highlight what we still have left in our schedule. Following this at 2 p.m. Eastern, we have the Strut Your Stuff Informal Fashion Show. Please come join us as our wonderful members show off some of the items they have made. Following that, we have a 3 p.m. Marketplace Live featuring Susan's Fiber and a 4 p.m. Eastern Marketplace Live featuring John C. Campbell Folk School and Tommy Scanlon. We will wrap up Spinning and Weaving Week at 5 p.m. Eastern with closing remarks from our Executive Director, Elizabeth Williamson. But to kick off this hour of Thread Talks, we are joined by Carl Stewart from Canada. He is going to be talking to us about the Great Claw. Heritage Fabrics and Contemporary Textile Art. Take it away, Carl. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here and click share to, and everyone can see it. Awesome. Uh, first, I'd just really like to thank the HGA for including me in the Thread Talk series and especially Sally, Whitney, Kathy, and Elizabeth. It's just it's been so great and so fun. Oh, and to any Canadians on the call, happy Thanksgiving. Um, so let's get started. Um, my talk this afternoon is The Great Cloth examines the influence of what I call heritage fabrics on contemporary textile art, particularly the influence of estate tweeds on my project Clomore. The earliest memory I have of fabric is of tweed. Oops, okay. It doesn't. Oh, there we go, um, is of tweed. Specifically, the fabric of a Harris tweed jacket my mother made up into a vest for me to wear in my grade one school photo. And for a very long time, I believe that Harris tweed- Hey Carl, I don't wanna interrupt you, but we're just still seeing the title slide. Oh, okay, then there's something kooky going on. I'm gonna stop the share and I'm going to try it again and share. Everyone seeing that? We're seeing the title slide, yes. And it doesn't seem to want to advance. There it goes, there it goes. Okay, we awesome. You, we see you as a little kid. That's me as a little kid in my little vest that my mother made for me. Um, and for it, from a Harris tweed jacket. Um, and for a very long time, I believed that every tweed was a Harris tweed. But tweed refers to not a single cloth, but rather a whole family mm -hmm. of cloths. Um, that include that include Harris, Saxonese, Cheviots, Homespuns, Fantasy, Donegal, Shetland, West of England, Welsh, Yorkshire, and the focus of my talk today, estate tweeds. Estate tweeds were fabrics designed to be worn by the owners and staff of Scottish hunting estates. The designers, often the estate owners themselves, look to the landscapes of their estates for inspiration, the heather, the lichen, the stone, the mountains, and the lakes. And the tweeds were essentially camouflage for the various members of the hunting parties. And it was taken very, very seriously. The owner of the Strathconan estate worked with a weaver on no less than eight versions of a tweed. And then he sent his staff up into the hills of the estate with the eight different fabrics while he sat on the back porch with a spyglass and looked from one to the next to the next to basically see which one he couldn't see. Widely recognized as the first estate tweed, the Glenfeshi is based on the shepherd's check, a, the traditional cloth worn by the shepherds of the border regions, an alternating black and white six thread check to which was added a red over check. Now you might not think that this would be the best choice if your goal is to blend in with your surroundings, but set against the black, white and pink granite of the Glenfeshi estate, it proved very, very effective. E.P. Harrison, the man who wrote the book on the history of Scottish estate tweeds, literally he wrote the book on the history of Scottish estate tweeds, categorized the fabrics into four groups. The first group, like the Glenfeshi, are variations of the shepherd's check and are known collectively as gun club checks. The second group is compri comprised of variations of the Glen Urquhart check, more popularly known as the Prince of Wales check. Harrison describes the third group as having no particular feature, which is a little unfair because it really means that they just don't easily fall into the first two groups and they fall far well out of the fourth. 
The fourth group is based on a plain ground, sometimes with applied yarn of two or more colors, but most often with what we think of as a tweed yarn with several colors carded together before being spun and then woven either with or without an overcheck. First woven in 1845, the Lovett mixture, which is shown here, is one of the very earliest tweeds in this group and one of the very first examples of cloth as protective coloring. It is also a perfect example of looking to the landscape as Lord Lovett did for its coloring, bluebells and primrose, bracken and birch. At the same time that Lord Lovett was designing his tweed, Lord Elko was raising the London Scottish Regiment. Believing that it was wrong that his men should wear something as conspicuous as the traditional scarlet uniform that the British Army had worn for decades, Lord Elko dressed his regiment in hodden grey. More commonly known as the Elko mixture, it's a blend of white and claret brown, and the Elko mixture is the precursor of the khaki uniform worn by the British Army, and in time the camouflage uniforms worn by armies around the world to this day. Lord Elko was a military man, and he is famous for having said, a soldier is a manhunter, neither more nor less. In early 2015, images circulated around the world showing Islamic State militants in the northern Iraqi city of Mosul executing men accused of committing homosexual acts. The bound and blindfolded men were taunted and beaten, taken to the top of a hundred foot building, then pushed to their deaths. As horrendous as these brutal killings by Isla Islamic State are, we would do well to remember that there are an estimated 72 countries around the world, some with legitimate democratically elected governments where homosexuality is against the law with penalties ranging from incarceration to execution. Fabric is fundamental to the making of culture and identity. From fabric, we can fashion what we need, create what we want, and define who we are. The gift of a piece of fabric is a gift imbued with possibility. The gift of a piece of handwoven fabric is an extension of the hand, a hand extended in, extended in support, hope, and love. Clo Moore is Scottish Gaelic for the great cloth. The symbolism embodied in Clomore speaks to the interconnectedness of our shared humanity and the responsibility we have to respect, defend, and care for one another. As weavers, we know to weave is to unite. And in that spirit of unity and solidarity, I've created my own Clomore. 72 unique pieces of handwoven fabric, one for each country where homosexuality is criminalized. The national flag of each of these 72 countries serves as, serves as the inspiration for the color, proportions, and the pattern of the fabrics. So I'm just going to sort of quickly sort of scroll through some of the flags and some of the fabrics here. Um, as, getting, as we were uh, waiting to join the call, um, we were talking about my, my studio and my process. Um, I work on a four harness, 27 inch four harness Leclerc floor loom. Um, the yarns that I'm using for the fabrics are from a mill in New Brunswick on Canada's East Coast. Uh, the mill is Briggs and Little. And I'm using a wool single and it's not it's not a particularly fine wool single so it's it's a little heavier maybe a blanket weight maybe slightly heavier than that and I chose that because I wanted the fabrics to have a real graphic quality within an exhibition space. Um, ooh. Um, some of the fabrics or some of the yarns rather um, I'm actually hand dyeing um, and using those in combination with the, the yarns from Briggs and Little. And I'll just move through a few more here. This is, is an example of one where I have um, over dyed the yarn from the Briggs and Little Mill. Um, it was a really, really like, wow, uh, bubblegum pink and a really bright peacock blue. And I've over dyed it with onion skins. As I said at the beginning, Clomore is heavily influenced by estate tweeds, fabrics originally designed as camouflage. 
And camouflage becomes a striking metaphor for how members of the LGBT communities in these 72 countries must, out of self-preservation, hide in plain sight, blend in, and pass for all intents and purposes as heterosexual. At the same time as conditions worsen for LGBTQ people in countries like Brunei and Chechnya and Saudi Arabia and their lives become more desperate, we see an increase in anti-immigrant and anti-refugee rhetoric, rhetoric across Eastern and Western Europe, the UK, the United States and Canada. How do you wrap yourself in the flag of your country if your country has denied you, has criminalized you? Unlike tartans, which are intended to be worn by members of a specific clan or family, wherever they might be in the world, estate tweeds were intended to be worn by people who live and work in the same area, regardless of familial ties. The early designers of estate tweeds looked to the landscape for their inspiration, and before the advent of synthetic dyes, the actual colors would have come from that same landscape, from the flowers, the plants, the trees, and lichen. The inclusion of yarns hand dyed with dye stuffs from my landscape, from my home, anchors the work here and creates a bridge, a sort of safe passage from that place to this place. And with an extended hand, we say you are welcome here and you are one of us. Now, with Lord Elko in mind and his choosing tweed over scarlet for his regimental uniforms, you might well be thinking, how are you not going to get noticed in one of these? Think of a zebra. If you're a zebra standing alone on a savanna, then there you are, a zebra. But if you're a zebra moving in a herd with other zebra, it's almost impossible to know where one ends and the next begins. The pattern breaks up the outline of each zebra. As gay kids and teenagers, we learn very early how to camouflage to break up the outlines of ourselves so that you don't really see us. Instead, what you see is a very polite boy, a straight A student, a star athlete, the best friend, and sometimes a weaver. Hiding in plain sight by sticking out may seem counterintuitive, but if you're looking here, or here, or here, then that means you're not looking here. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. That was wonderful. And thank you for spreading such a positive message and how you translated it into cloth. We, we appreciate it so much. And as you can see, his contact information is on the screen if you want to learn more. And I will stop sharing now. Thanks so much, everyone. Our next presenter in this hour of Thread Talks is Marcy Petrini. She is back with us today to share planning details for a unique project. Take it away, Marcy. Hi, um, thank you for having me back and welcome to my um, studio. <clears throat> I'm going to be sharing a screen here. So uh, here it is. And we'll make it a slide presentation. Okay. Um, so today it's a follow up from what I talked about on Friday in, uh, because we need details after we uh, plan. So we talked about how I may start with a, a piece with, um, um, with something in mind or a favorite yarn or perhaps studying a weave brief structure or just inspiration from nature. But no matter where I started, I still have to come up with a size um, for the piece, a yarn, a structure, and all of the details that are going to allow me to weave that cloth. The other consideration uh, is the loom size. So hopefully um, the project will be smaller than the loom size that we have available. But if not, we can always uh, make the um, panels and join them traditionally. Coverlets were done that way. Use double weave. Um, you also have um, a number of shafts that you need for the structures. And there were actually a couple of articles in past uh, Shadow Spindle and iPod, that right from the start articles that I write, that talked about how to um, either go up or go down with uh, the number of shafts. And finally, don't forget time. Uh, sometimes I have a deadline for um, a guild um, exhibit 
that I would like to meet. And so I need to plan accordingly. Um, what I use for planning the details is this um, weaving project sheet, which is actually a spreadsheet now. Uh, and you, I know you can't see the details, but basically it's divided in uh, uh, three broad areas. So here, and we'll talk about them. Um, here is planning on the left here is planning the warp, um, the, the width on the right is the length. In the middle here is the amount of yarn that I, I may need to calculate if I have to buy it or even to make sure that I have enough on my shelf. Then the details of dressing the loom, threading and so forth. And that's that part, the two thirds here are first done uh, before I start weaving. And then after the cloth comes off the loom, then there is the finishing and we'll talk about that as well. So I have uh, an uh, item size, structure, yarn, loom, and time, and uh, I'm ready to go to the next uh, stage. But don't forget scale. That's something that we often um, don't think about. We may have a drawdown that we made or from a, a, a book, and the drawdown is made to maximize the structure, not necessarily what it's gonna look like. Um, here I have uh, three pieces of uh, cloth the gold is all straight twill and you can see how different they are depending on the size of the yarn and hence the size of the set. Uh, in this particular twill, um, the M and W twill, if it's a 22 thread repeat. So the other way to think about it is that if I set that at 24, this repeat is going to be an inch. If I set it at 18, it's going to be three quarters of an inch. If I set it at 12, it's going to be two inches. So you can think about um, your set and your, uh, and your thread repeat. If you have a motif like you may have, or here you have a motif, it's two, uh, two uh, uh, letters. Um, you can also visually cut the, uh, a piece of paper or graph paper and, and see what that looks like and place it. <clears throat> I had a, um, one of my uh, friends that is doing that with uh, a lacy weave uh, motif for um, curtains. Then next we have to um, think about the warp dimensions and uh, um, we have a finish width that we decided on and a finish length and there's gonna be take up and shrinkage. Uh, and I like to think of them differently, separately, because they affect, they're affected by different factors that we'll talk about in a minute. But this will allow to, to uh, calculate the width and the loom. And the same thing with the finished length, except we have to add loom waste. This is why I like to keep them separately. Some people uh, dump, uh, place them together, and it's okay if you like to, you know, you prefer thinking that way. But to me, the width they cup is, um, is, is uh, influenced by the structure. Here I have a, a picture of a waffle weave, which is, um, does a lot of pulling in. Uh, and also the weaver, some people draw in more than the other. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, for the shrinkage, both for width and length, you have the fiber to consider. Um, uh, mercerized cotton shrinks less than mercerized cotton. And then the wet finishing technique that you use, you know that if you felt. Um, the, for the length, the uh, structure is also important, but also is the tension that you keep your warp at. Different people like to have different tensions and that does influence the take up. For loom waste, um, each loom has a different loom waste. You should measure it for your loom to be more accurate, but you need to remember that sometimes um, a wider piece is gonna have more loom waste than a narrower piece. It kind of makes sense if you think about it because there's more uh, room for threads crossing the back and all that. So measure it several times for different uh, widths so that you know, the width of cloth so that you know what your loom waste is. Then once we have our finished width and our finished length, then we need to uh, remember to um, determine the set. And the set is of course the um, influenced by the grist of the yarn. Here we wrap um, yarn in an inch of fiber uh, and an inch of, uh, and the ruler. And that gives us half of that is the, what we will set it for a tabby. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the structure also influences the, um, the, the set. We'll talk about that and whether we balance the fabric or not. Your final item, if you use the same yarn for a jacket, you would not set it the same way as a, a play, placemat. I wouldn't, I would set the placemat a lot more uh, closely than I would uh, say a scarf or a shawl. Uh, slip fibers tend to be slippery. So I said my silk and, and tensels uh, 
a little bit closer than the um, than I would say a, a mercer, an unmercerized cotton. And finally, the bead influences the set, or I should say that uh, when you beat the fabric, um, if you tend to beat a little bit harder, like I do, um, I adjust that rather than trying to fight it by increasing my set just a little bit so that it's going to be more resistance to my beat. Here is a, uh, some ideas about set and structure. Uh, a, pal a, pla a pallet balance plain weave is going to be half warp and half weft. That's called a tabby. And we, as I I'm already mentioned, it's half the grist. A tabby is not an, a synonym for plain weave. It's a synonym for a balanced plain weave. Uh, I uh, set my twills closer than uh, about 20% closer than I would a tabby. I should mention that there is a formula to calculate uh, the set according to the st structure, but it doesn't work really well for unbalanced fabrics. It works best if you have a tutu twill or a, or, um, a, a multi chef twill that is more balanced. Um, if we have a supplementary warp or weft or tied weave, any fabric that has a background of uh, plain weave, we open the set a little bit more to adjust for the supplementary uh, yarns. And finally, when I was starting to um, study unit weaves many years ago, those are the, your uh, lazy weaves, I read by different authors that you said that a unit weaves more open, the same as or closer to tabby. So I was like, oh, okay, well, who's right? Well, they're all right. Because if you have um, blocks of, of lace and, uh, and tabby about equal amount, you can set it as tabby. If you have a lot of huck lace like all over the cloth, you may wanna set that a little bit closer so your fabric doesn't become sleazy. But if you have a lot of plain weave and just a few um, blocks of lace, you might want to open it up to showcase the lace. And the other thing to think about is the difference between the unbalanced fabrics and the set continuum. So an unbalanced fabric is like 3-1 or 1-2 um, twill or a satin, where the front and the back of the fabric are different. One is warp dominant and the other one is weft dominant, but they are different. In a set continuum, we have all of the um, all of the fabrics have the same front and back. So here you have a weft face uh, fabric that will make a great rug. Um, that obviously the set in there is very open because we want all the face all the weft to um, cover the warp and the warp face on the other side and everything in between. So how do we choose the stake up shrinkage set? Well experience and that I and, and if you're beginning weaving you're like yeah right well actually start by keeping good records I wish that now I keep good records now but when I go back to my early days of weaving which was a long time ago like in the late 70s um, I'm really appalled at how bad my records were and yarns that I didn't you know mention uh, the set or just bad records now with computers it makes it a lot easier so keep keep good records so that you gain your experience and look back at them if you're using something similar. Of course, the experience of other accounts. So talk to your mentors, guild members online or otherwise and search publication, but always get more than one opinion because I already told you about the lace weave. So different people use them in different amounts and so that uh, you get different, different answers. So just search, that's research. And of course, sample. And I always like to say the sample is a six, not a four letter word. And remember that if you're sampling on a separate warp, that sometimes we have to do that the narrow warp, if you do it on a narrow warp, it may incre actually may increase the beat and the fabric may be a little bit stiffer than the, than the final fabric would be on a larger um, warp. What I like to do is to um, add extra length to the sample warp that I um, use. So I, then I can weave it, cut off, finish it, and that lets me know whether the fabric is okay, you know, whether I like it or whether I have to adjust. If you adjust the set, be mindful that you're going to change the width. So if you're adjusting, you know, closer, of course, it's, you're going to be narrower uh, width. And if you're just more open, you're going to have larger. But also there's going to could be issues in the tension because um, to keep a good tension, every thread should be perpendicular uh, uh, um, next to each other in a straight line. And if you're um, pulling in, then all of a sudden the width in the back beam is gonna be narrower than the width in the front. I like to adjust for set 
by not adjusting the set, by adjusting the weft size. So if my set is a little too open, then I just find a yarn that is a little bit um, fatter. If the, my set is too close, I pick a weft that's a little bit narrower. That has always worked for me. I don't know if it works for other people, but I really like that solution. Okay, so we now finally get to having to match the word pencil to structure repeat. I have a, a spreadsheet for that too. And actually this was featured in one of my articles right from the start. Uh, and I made it available and several people requested it. And it, you certainly can get it now. Um, the, my email will be available at the end of the talk. And this does a lot of the calculations for you. So the first thing to decide is whether you need floating salvages or, fl or balanced thread. Here you can see the balanced thread and this um, bird's eye twill. A floating salvages, you may or may not have to um, think about a front. It depends whether you're using the width of the loom. If you're using the width of the loom, um, then um, you have to leave room in the, in the read for them. The same thing with balancing motif. Here is the uh, M and W's that we saw a minute ago. And um, if you have M and W, then at the end, you need a balancing motif. So as I said before, there are 22 threads and uh, repeats in this motif. And so we put those numbers in in the, um, in the spreadsheet and it will tell us how many repeats of, of the um, motif we can have in the, in the uh, number of threads that we chose. And then it's gonna tell us what we have to do to make it even because I certainly like an even motif um, in my fabric. And so sometimes we have to subtract, sometimes we have to add, sometimes we can do uh, interesting things with the edges. I think that was discussed in there right from the start as well. We're ready to weave or, or at least to thread, but think about your motif. Here is the original, the way it's written, the way it's traditionally written, but be, just because it's traditionally written that way doesn't mean that that's the way you want it in your cloth. So I find this motif of the W more attractive when we uh, weave the um, uh, M actually, um, so that what I would prefer doing is start with that. And so I rearranged it on my on the right here so that my, my motif starts with a W and end with a W. And I have that extra thread to get the uh, a one to get the motif balance because I like these little um, extra threads sticking out in the motif. And similarly, when we get to treadle, I, even the arranged threading looks like it's chopped off on the top. So I simply rearrange the, uh, the threading and start with uh, a one and four to get that extra um, shot here. So that um, obviously if I was weaving a table runner, say with this motif, there would be a lot more M and W in between and, in, and down the line, but you would have a nice uh, balanced motif that has, uh, or I should say symmetrical, that has the same motifs in the corner. I I'm not big on symmetry all the times, but there are times when motifs really look better if they're symmetrical. Okay, so we finally finished weaving. So this is what I do. I measure, I take it off the loom and I measure the loom uh, to determine the take up. And I measure, this is the time I measure my loom waist as well. The front loom waist and the back loom waist because we tie on in some way. So that's loom waist too. Then I dry finish it. I don't do a whole lot of sewing anymore as I mentioned on Friday, but I may have hemming to do. I may have um, a, a twist, a, I have to twist fringes. Um, I usually dry finish it, although if I'm going to hem it, I usually do it after the wet finishing. But after I do that, then I wet finish it. And, and I like to wet finish it in the way that it's going to be done for the rest of its life. Um, <clears throat> so if it's a table runner, it's going to be uh, washed in, in the washing machine with, uh, um, with cool water. That allows me to determine the shrinkage. And this is the part here, the bottom of the sheet that does all the calculations for me once I put in my measurements. And finally, I like to ask myself, um, what do I like about this project? This is an assessment, which I think it's really important because this is how you, this is not beat yourself up. This is um, doing, getting better. We can, there's always room to get better and here. So I think about, okay, so what do I like? What did I do right here? But I also ask myself, okay, what could I have done better? Sometimes what did I do wrong, but what could I have done better? Here, what I could have done better is I could have ironed this piece before Terry took a picture, but anyway. And then even if I'm not going to be weaving this um, twill next, I like to think about 
what would I do next with this? What would be the next na natural next step? Because by doing that, it allows me to think about the possibility of the structure and eventually I, turn, I, re I may return to it. Okay, thank you for your attention. That's all I have to say this afternoon. There's my email, marcipetrini at gmail. Feel free to email me um, with any question or if you would like a copy of the um, spreadsheet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy, for all your wonderful presentations this week. We really appreciate it. Our final speaker today in our Thread Talk Hour is, is Leslie Fesperman. And she's going to give us a little bit of info on the history of Yadkin Valley Fiber Center. Hello. Take it away, Leslie. Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you for having me today and for all the wonderful things that you have done this week for spinning and weaving week. I'm getting ready to share my screen. If you can bear with me for one second. And let's see, I need to get that up to the top and okay, can everybody, I hope hear me okay. Thank you so much for having me and I'm delighted that you're spending a little bit of your time with me on the Sunday afternoon to learn about the Yakin Valley Fiber Center, who we are, what we do, and how we've gotten to where we are. Um, I started teaching weaving around 2010-2011 um, because the community college where I was taking a weaving class, the instructor was retiring and they were gonna close the program. And I just felt like that was such a shame that we couldn't allow these heritage crafts. They just seemed to be kind of getting pushed aside and other things come in and we were losing that. So I approached them and asked them if I could um, teach beginning weaving and they said I could. And that's how my journey into teaching weaving um, started. And it has grown since then. Um, I. Um, after I started teaching weaving at the community college, my husband took a um, position in the foothills of North Carolina and we moved and relocated. And so I was without a place to teach and I, I wanted to continue that. I found that I liked teaching. I liked to see the excitement that people got when they learned how to weave and I also liked to see what they did after they learned to weave. So I started to look, I looked in our local community and the Foothills Arts Center at that time was not expanding programs. They were located on Church Street in a house and did not have room for our program. And I looked at the neighboring community, which was Yak and Bill, and they had an art center with studio spaces. And initially they didn't have a space for um, me to have a studio or to teach, but I was very persistent and would go down there every three or four weeks and say, anything open, anything change. And as I did that, our conversations grew and my ideas about teaching evolved into more of having a program for weavers and fiber enthusiasts. In August of 2015, I got a call and they said, there's a building for rent. If you would like to start a program, we'll rent it and you can do that. And so I never looked back. I started, um, scheduling instructors. I called Old College in Canada and said, you know, I would love to have your master weaving program. And the first thing they said is, well, we can't bring our looms. And I was like, oh, you don't need to bring your looms. We'll figure it out. We just need you to come. And I started having these relationships with Old College and instructors across the country and internationally. And the program started. We opened our doors in 2015, which was the beginning. I started teaching um, beginning classes in the winter of 2016. And in um, May of 2016, we had our first master weaving program. Um, in 2019, we'd finished our second. So we have had both um, national and international instructors come. Daryl Lancaster was one of the first instructors that said she would come teach. And Jason Collingwood was one of the first international instructors that said he would come teach at our facility. Um, we are planning our calendar now for 21, very slowly. I'm looking um, to have uh, Jennifer Moore, Rosalie Nelson, and hopefully Diane Totten in 21. Um, in addition to having guest instructors and teaching beginning classes, we want to be a place where people can come in guilds and have meetings and go beyond just a kind of classroom setting. And so we offer space to guilds to come in and have um, 
their workshop-centered um, classes and retreats or gatherings. This is a photo of the Southwest uh, the Southeastern Complex Weavers getting together for a small weekend of sharing and learning. And um, it was really fun to see them on this old dilapidated um, loom because I was trying to pull any loom I could get, whether it be a table loom or floor loom, eight shafts or more, so that they could have some demos. And they had a lot of fun on this structo, as you can see. Um, we also have the Mountain Homespun Guild, which is a local guild in our community. This is their spinning group. They come in um, once a month and spin on our porch or in the, in the room, and they are a very unstructured um, guild, but they share and teach each other, and they have so much fun when they come, and it's a real joy to host them. In addition to Complex Weavers coming and also the Mountain Home Fun Guild, we host the annual retreat for Tapestry Weavers South, and we also have their exhibit, New Works by Tapestry Weavers South, which will be in June of 21. And um, we hope one day to have small expressions. The center that we're in um, now is growing and expanding, and we are going to have state-of-the-art um, classrooms and galleries and things as time goes by. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So after um, I started the program in Yakinville, it became clear after a year and a half or so that there was really room to grow the program. And their focus was always and still is on performing arts more than the creative arts. And we um, decided that maybe we should part ways and I started looking at other places. I came back to the community of Elkin and approached the Foothills Arts Council again. And this time I approached um, Dan Butner, who is our executive director, and I was asking, I said, do you just know of a place I could rent? And A, it's got to be dry and B, it's got to be cheap. And he laughed and he said, you have to be quiet. And he pulled out this plan for the historic Chatham Mill and the YMCA building. They had just entered into a conversation about acquiring this building and starting an art school. So my timing could not have been better. They had a fiber um, program already dedicated. And so it just was a natural fit. So I moved and they said, we'll give you the upstairs of the house until we move to this other location and we'll, we'll work it out. We know you need space, we'll figure something out. And um, so I moved and I had to be really quiet about it and I was just pinching myself all the time because I, I knew that the space was coming. So we were there until um, the fall winter of 2019 and we've got about three to 4,000 square feet now, I believe. I've got three teaching classrooms and we have a dye lab. So we want to expand our programming and really serve all the fiber arts over time. Our dye lab um, has counters and burners because it was the textile company um, and they did their testing in the area that I'm located in now. They um, left me all kinds of goodies. And so I really have a lab for our dyeing. It's kind of made me feel a little bit more like I need to be a little bit better with record keeping. As Marcy said, I don't always do that. Um, but the dye lab is wonderful. We host um, a dye day once a month. And um, this is when experienced dyers can come in and use our facility. And we provide the basics. So currently, we've been offering acid fast fiber reactive and indigo um, dyeing. So they'll come in and there'll be a bat ready for them to use. Everybody has their own setup, their own counters, their own sinks, and they can spend the day. And we um, have had a few dye classes and we plan to expand that and go into some natural dyeing. Um, also on our calendar for 21, we would like to go into some fiber preparation um, type of classes um, for spinners and felters and things like that. Um, we teach on a quarterly basis, beginning weaving classes. I instruct on the rigid heddle, the inkle loom, and also the four shaft loom. And we are um, speaking with someone about coming in and to teach tapestry on a quarterly basis. We feel that we need to offer those programs frequently and in a small setting so that people can get the benefit of getting a good foundation and in individual instruction as they learn and begin to learn the craft to start their journey elsewhere. This is a picture of the tapestry class and a tapestry weaver we had back in March. 
and smiling faces. Um, the people are what makes the Yakin Valley Fiber Center what it is. Friendships are formed, friendships are reunited, and people get excited about learning, seeing each other, and sometimes it's not even the fiber things that they learn, it's just everything else. It's being together and it's being in person. And that is one thing I've learned this year. We are in-person learning and I cherish that and am so happy for that. Back in um, January, we had a beginning class and we had a um, weaver, uh, someone come in to learn weaving and she said she was a textile designer. She had worked her entire life and had just retired and she wanted to learn how to weave. And so she took our beginning class and she was very tearful because she said, I never realized what weavers actually do, what there is to weaving. All I've done is design cloth. And I thought that was a real eye opener. Um, kind of to industry and, and how sometimes we're very separated with what we do in our textile um, uh, uh, careers. On, oops, sorry. Um, on the right, or on the left, excuse me, you'll see the Gilvin Rife YMCA, that's a current picture, and on the left there's a picture of the Chatham Mill. This is a very old textile mill. At one time it was the largest producer of textiles in the United States. And this is where the Fiber Center has landed, and we're doing renovations right now, so we're kind of doing what I call all the ugly work, roofing, electric, plumbing, wiring, we're just getting started on all that. So we kind of, we, we shift ourselves around every, every so often to make, make sure that we can get things done. But I think it's wonderful how a fiber program has landed in a textile mill. And we have been very welcome and feel very supported from for the community. Um, you'll see my um, contact information. Um, let's see where did it go? Sorry. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. I love. I hope our fiber paths will cross one day. Um, more importantly, I can um, encourage everyone to continue your education. Continue to support the Hand Weavers Guild of America. They have done such a fantastic job. I hope I meet some of you in Knoxville in a couple of years. I really have missed our in-person this year. Um, but do support your local organizations and guilds. I know I'm, um, and that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, your Fiber Center sounds like a wonderful place. Um, and I hope I can visit one day once we're through this pandemic. I hope you can too. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to all our viewers for tuning in to this Thread Talk and all of our Thread Talks this week. And be sure to come join us at 2 p.m. Eastern and watch as our members walk the virtual runway in our Strut Your Stuff informal fashion show. We'll see you there.